Good morning. Very happy Thursday to you all. Um, we have just got a few more people signing in, so I will give it a minute and put myself on mute before I do a proper introduction. So for those of you who are here already, thank you. But we'll just hang on another minute uh, for the other attendees to uh, to find their way in. Good morning, let's get started then. Um, my name is uh, Rick Steele. I'm the Senior Account Manager here at Satisnet, and I'm very pleased to welcome you along to this Tenable.ad event. Um, Satisnet's mission is to make enterprise grade security tooling more accessible to more organisations. And we do this via managed services, via consultancy, via training, uh, and we also do it by building great partnerships with uh, enterprise vendors such as Tenable and Tenable are one of our favourites and I think we're one of Tenable's favourite partners as well because I'm quite smug and proud to announce that this is the first UK partner Tenable.ad event webinar so welcome you are the first to uh, get this from Tenable since they bought Alcid so I'm going to hand over to Chris Eves uh, he's a Tenable security engineer uh, he's going to talk us through this uh, fantastic new piece of tooling. Here you go, Chris. Well, thanks, Rick. Um, hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. I'm, uh, as Rick said, Chris Eves, and I'm one of the security engineers here for uh, Tenable.ad now. Um, so I came along with the LCID acquisition. Um, I've been at LCID for, for two years prior. Uh, and today we're just going to run through kind of a bit of a, a sales deck um, or a corporate deck that's going to introduce um, the, the Tenable.ad solution, kind of where this where this fits. We'll talk a little bit about the history of the company um, and then we'll go into a bit of a demonstration so we can show you um, what, the, what the solution offers. So um, in terms of um, really kind of where the, where the solution sits is the, the the company was founded by two leading incident responders based out of France, um, a chap called Emmanuel and a, another chap called Luke. Um, now they were doing a number of different things um, from, you know, they were, they were the guys that were parachuted in at the point of breach to understand what was going on and kind of build reports and incident response plans. Uh, but they were also doing a lot of red teaming exercises, uh, penetration tests, for example, to understand, you know, where there are holes and gaps and again, build reports off the back of this. And there are a couple of things that they found in that, um, you know, AD plays a pivotal part in pretty much every attack scenario. Um, you know, attackers look for domain dominance. Um, they go for um, domain admin accounts, which gives them access to pretty much everything within inside the business. Um, and a lot of organizations were really spending a lot of money protecting the perimeter, um, you know, going over and above, um, you know, protecting the perimeter, protecting the endpoint, um, only to find out that this wasn't kind of a, a complete 100% solution. Um, and when attackers were getting in, which they still were, um, they were having pretty much a free reign over Active Directory. So they decided to, to really kind of look at the market at this point, um, and they built the solution off the back of it, which is where we sit today. Um, you know, now we've been acquired by Tenable. You know, we are now a global organization. We've got entities in, in quite a few regions. Um, we've got a lot of customers. Um, pre previously, we had over 100, but um, we are now uh, expanding that number quite quickly. So why Active Directory? Um, why well, Active Directory really holds the keys to, to everything inside the organization. You know, we have applications through um, Active Directory access. We have data through Active Directory access security groups, for example. Um, Active Directory holds you know, a, a copy of all passwords for user accounts, privileged accounts. Um, it holds a lot of the, the kind of lookup records for where these objects sit. So exchange servers, for example, application servers, um, domain controllers, all of these kind of very sensitive objects that allow attackers to start navigating the environment, uh, but understanding where they sit to be able to target them. Um, it's been around a long time. Um, but also, you know, really behind um, every breach um, or every headline really is, is an insecure Active Directory. Um, and we see this time and time again. And the most recent kind of example of this is the SolarWinds attack. 
um, FireEye have done analysis of the SolarWinds attack, um, and what they found was that there was a piece of code um, in the malware used in the SolarWinds attack that essentially said, if the machine is domain joined, continue the attack. If the if the machine or the device we are on is not domain joined, um, basically stop at that point. You know, uh, they didn't want any further part. They didn't want to move any further. It was you know, only continue if this machine is domain joined. And I think again that plays a very powerful message to, just to show how important and how critical Active Directory is, not only for organizations but also for attackers because it's it's how they operate. It's how they build their threat, their kind of uh, battlefield, as it were. Now, here's just a couple of statistics that we've um, that we've kind of gathered from the field. But I mean, 60 new 60 percent of new malware includes specific code that targets Active Directory. I mean, this is a huge figure um, you know, and, and we're seeing this now through several different techniques. You know, we, we see ransomware as a service, for example. Um, you know, now it, it's almost a commodity or malware has become a commodity. I mean, you can go onto the dark web, um, you can purchase malware very, very cheaply um, and you can send that off and, and ultimately see if you can get paid for it. I mean, 80 percent of global organizations were audited um, or audited for Active Directory had issues um, and had critical misconfigurations in place. Um, and we see this a lot often in the field when we're you know, doing deployments, when we're configuring into organizations. Um, we still see this time and time again. Um, and actually, you know, the, the big statistic here is, you know, over 95 percent of organizations still rely heavily on Active Directory services. <clears throat> now, what this means is that actually attackers have consistency. You know, attackers don't need to learn a new technique or a new skill here because they can almost guarantee that if they get inside an organization, they're going to have Active Directory to play with. Uh, they're going to have Active Directory to target. They don't need to learn a new skill or a new technique once they're inside the organization. They just repeat the same exercises that they're used to using. Um, now, I mean, just an example of some of the kind of organizations that have been attacked over the years. I mean, this is really, again, just to highlight the, the fact here that um, you know, this, this does play a big part. This does play a big problem. And we know that Active Directory played a big part in a lot of these, whether that was to move laterally or to escalate privileges. So what are some of the challenges that, that we look to solve? Um, well, one of the biggest challenges actually is just that organizations struggle to get a grasp or visibility over uh, over anything inside Active Directory. Um, you know, it's a, it's a big and a huge complex application now, particularly when organizations spread across in multiple regions across the globe. We have different entities where we've grown through mergers and acquisitions. We have different business units. Each of them maybe have their own domain, their way of monitoring it. Um, and we lose visibility once we start to, to expand the business in these ways. It's incredibly difficult to understand the entire threat landscape and the risk exposure. You know, if we have grown through these kind of mergers and acquisitions, we have expanded the company through organic growth over 20 years. You know, how do we understand exactly where Active Directory is at risk? As a result of the top two, it becomes very difficult to start creating and prioritizing things like remediation efforts and remediation plans. You know, how do we know where to target if we can't see everything that, that is visible or, or at risk inside our Active Directory environment? Um, as a result, we're also unable to ensure that security policies are actually being followed and enforced. Um, if we have several different teams managing different entities, different domains across the globe, each one wants to put their own stamp on it. How do we enforce a global or a central policy to say, you know, here's what should be applied to all domain environments? You know, how do we track that? How do we enforce it? Um, often there's a knowledge gap when it comes to actually securing Active Directory. You know, we see a lot of people that are using Active Directory um, are able to really support it, manage it, maintain it, make changes in it, but actually understanding some of the security risks that these underlying changes pose. Um, also understanding you know, some of the inner workings of Active Directory, for example, how Kerberos works. Um, you know, these are very different skill sets, and I think often um, a lot of organizations lack this kind of expertise or uh, this knowledge, which is why we see a lot of these kind of misconfigurations, these weaknesses creeping in over a long period of time that now lead to the, the issue that we see today. Um, and that really falls into the same point in, in six is kind of a lack of understanding of, of the importance across Active Directory. Um, you know, we know that it's important. We know that it governs a lot of access to applications, data, um, and yet we don't treat it that way. So how do we get, again, a foothold across Active Directory? How do we understand the risk? How do we prioritize? You know, this is this kind of application that sits at the heart of the business. 
And finally, um, uh, what we see is traditional AD monitoring and security solutions really lack any actionable information. Um, it, I, I don't know if anyone here has spent any time looking at Windows security logs across the domain controllers. Um, when you have to collect these locally from every single domain controller and, and analyze the event, um, it's incredibly difficult to understand kind of what's going on, um, what context this means to the business. Um, and I think having this information on top of these events um, is only powerful and, and helps to reduce things like remediation times. Now, what we want to do is, is start to disrupt common attack paths. Um, so attackers look to get an initial foothold inside the business. They might do this through uh, phishing attacks. They might do this through malware injection. Um, once they get an initial foothold, they'll go for things like local admin across the, the endpoint that they've gathered access to. And then they're going to start to explore the environment. Now, exploiting the environment could be done in a number of different ways. We could do it through PowerShell. We could do it through command line. We could do reverse DNS lookups. We could do something like Bloodhound to understand the kind of attack surface across Active Directory. Once we've explored the environment, we're going to want to understand how we can elevate our privileges. How do we get access to you know, privileged accounts and how do we make sure that we can guarantee that our attack is a success? We can do this in a number of different ways. We not only do we want to elevate privileges, but we also want to maintain persistence. You know, we want to leave backdoor techniques, for example. We're then going to start to evade um, you know, detection. We're going to use different accounts. We're going to use different entities. Uh, we're going to put the security teams off their tracks. They're going to then establish the foothold inside the environment. They're going to look to uh, um, uh, execute code, for example, they're going to look to drop files into different areas to, to do, you know, start encrypting data, which is what we see in ransomware activities, um, leaving files behind and, and ransomware notes, um, or they're going to look at exfiltrating data at the business to, to maybe sell on the dark web. Now, traditional solutions kind of in this space um, really make it difficult to to give organizations i think a fighting chance when we talk when we talk about kind of proactivity um, you know how do we as an organization get a foothold over this today without relying on attacker to be inside the business before we start our kind of incident investigations so what we've seen is many organizations start to focus heavily on kind of post compromise detection techniques which really rely, rely on you know attackers being inside the organization performing these attack scenarios and then alerting on these activities happening and we don't want to wait for this to happen because often once it's happened, it's too late. What we want to do is give organizations the ability to proactively look at Active Directory, proactively harden the security posture, reduce that threat landscape and make it much more difficult for attackers to perform these common techniques that allow them to escalate privileges or move laterally and, and deeper inside the organization. We see a high volume of events, um, which leads to a high volume of alerts. Um, and, and also we see a lot of false positives as a result. I used to spend a lot of time looking at security logs and analyzing security logs, um, investigating alerts that were triggered based on security logs, um, only to spend sort of hours looking at these alerts to find out that we were missing particular events from a domain controller, um, or we weren't collecting the right events in the first place. Um, and you know, I think when you're looking at these kind of solutions, you have to make sure that an event logging policy or an auditing policy is 100 percent correct before, uh, you know, before you start to investigate security incidents. It becomes very difficult if it isn't. We see traditional kind of audits and pen tests, which are run you know, maybe once a year biannually, um, but they are a point in time snapshot at that point. Active Directory is a living organism that sits inside the business and really um, you know, moves, breathes um, uh, and kind of changes as the business changes. So um, it isn't enough really today to be doing a, a yearly audit across our Active Directory environment. We need continuous monitoring. We need to understand continuous risk to be able to prioritize our remediation efforts. But also, as we talked about, is to proactively harden the Active Directory infrastructure. Now here, I like to just put up kind of a, a typical scenario of the cyber kill chain, and, and really this allows us to position you know where we sit um, in this in this kind of cyber kill chain. So we've mapped a couple of solutions here to to these different areas and, and where they sit, um, and where Tenable.ad really starts to sit is between steps five and eight, so the widespread compromise. Once they're into the business, how do they start to move laterally? How do they target points where they can move laterally to? How do they start to not only steal credentials, but replay these credentials? How do they escalate privileges to uh, you know, domain admins, for example, enterprise admins? 
Um, and then how do they leave backdoor techniques? How do they maintain persistence across these objects? So that's where we sit today. Uh, and you can see some of the solutions that we have in place now. CyberArk is a PAM solution that sits on top, protecting things like privileged accounts. Um, we have Quest Change Auditor, we've got Manage Engine, which really sit in the same camp, but they're looking at security logs um, and they're really looking at tracking changes across Active Directory and not necessarily providing a security context behind a lot of these changes that are made. And then we have Microsoft, which has two different solutions where they have kind of an AD wrap or RAS assessment, which is a kind of point in time audit of the Active Directory environment. This is a bit of a health check, but also does some level of security. Um, and then they now have kind of three different revisions of their kind of AD security solution, which is um, ATA, so Advanced Threat Analytics, ATP, which is Advanced Threat Protection, um, and Defender for uh, or Identity for Defender or Defender for Identity. Um, now, Defender for Identity is really focusing on post compromise detection, kind of breach detection, um, looking for different attack scenarios inside the business is not necessarily allowing you to get a, uh, a proactive kind of start on you know, how you can harden that posture and make some of those attack techniques um, you know, a lot more difficult to, to, to provide or to start inside the organization. So what is it we're going to look to do? Um, well, Tenable.ad follows really a, a kind of four step methodology. I mean, first and foremost, we want to find and fix existing weaknesses. So we're going to do a scan of the Active Directory environment and we're going to look for historic changes, weaknesses, vulnerabilities that ultimately can lead to compromise um, or different areas that attackers can, can exploit. We're also going to um, start to uncover new attack pathways. Now, when we talk about uncovering new attack pathways, this is about continuously monitoring Active Directory to understand if a change is made to an object, a uh, group membership, for example, a group policy object, how does that give an attacker a chance to either escalate privileges, use that change that's been made um, against the organization? So we're going to be able to track all changes made to Active Directory. We're going to understand and contextualize these changes. So if they do pose a risk or uncover a new attack pathway that attackers look to exploit, we're going to flag those as alerts. We're going to be able to detect ongoing attacks in real time. So this is really about um, understanding when attackers are getting in and, and actually escalating privileges. And if we see a, a, an odd sequence of events that could be, you know, a, a brute force attack, for example, followed by a successful authentication, we see group membership changes at that point, um, followed by access controllers changes over a domain controller and then a successful authentication across a DC. You know, this actually could pose you know, a very common attack scenario and we want to make sure that we can detect this and give you visibility of it as quickly as possible. We're then going to give you the ability to hunt for threats um, through through an interface, which we'll go through in the demonstration, uh, but also start to do things like forensic investigations. How do we search across Active Directory to track the activities that an attacker may be performing? How do we track the sequence of events that happen through a particular scenario? Um, and how do we delve into that detail? We're going to do this very differently to the way that other organizations track and look at Active Directory. Um, we do this through the use of no agents, no privileges. So we are completely non-intrusive inside the organization. Um, and we use a, uh, to do this, we use a, a kind of an AD native technology. So the reason that a lot of organizations or kind of solutions in this space will deploy agents and have privileges is because they monitor the security log. And it's very difficult to do that without an agent or privileges. So what we do is we connect to um, what we call a replication API that sat in Active Directory. This API is responsible for all replication traffic between domain controllers. So when you make a change to a group membership, for example, when you reset a password, when you change or create a group policy object, that's going to change um, attributes, it's going to change objects in Active Directory, which are then going to replicate between all the domain controllers to ensure that the Active Directory databases on each of those domain controllers is up to date and has the latest information. So at this point, we want to make sure that really, you know, we're tracking those changes, we're understanding what's going on, but we also don't need to rely on event log correlation at that point. We don't need to rely on event logging policies. We're going to capture information in real time as it changes through the AD environment. And that's how we start to deliver near instant value. We're going to be able to get in very quickly um, through the use of no agents and no privileges. Um, we're going to be able to capture a snapshot of your Active Directory environment very quickly, and then we're going to track changes continuously. 
Now, I think at this point, I'd like to move into a demonstration and really just start to show you, you know, what this looks like um, and really how we start to you know, really provide this value back to the organization and start to track changes made to Active Directory. So here, hopefully everyone can see my screen OK. Um, once we've done this initial scan um, of Active Directory, and we're now monitoring these changes in real time. Uh, what we're going to be able to do is start to give a, the organization a picture or a dashboard format of what our Active Directory looks like. Um, you know, common scenarios are things like joiners, leavers, movers, processes, is understanding when accounts get disabled inside the business, how these numbers fluctuate over a period of time. Here we're going to be able to start to trend this information so we can do this through a line graph where we can start to see that, um, you know, how this number trends and fluctuates. So very quickly we see it seeing uh, being fairly static and now we see it jump quite significantly um, to 934 and, and eight disabled users. Yeah, we want to make sure that we're tracking this activity and again we can start to ask the questions behind you know, has a policy broken down here um, you know is this a risk or, or an issue inside the business that we need to monitor we can then put counter widgets against each of these so being able to understand at that point in time what are the numbers associated to each of these areas and all this information can be customized so we can move it around it auto updates as we just saw there from the refresh um, we can add new widgets to really build out the dashboard and we can also add dashboards where you're going to see these appearing across the top. So if we do have a multi domain environment, we could have a dashboard for each different domain that we're monitoring. Uh, we can have a dashboard to look at different areas of Active Directory where here I have a top issues in my domain environment or my Active Directory and we can start to see and plot different data points. We can see different areas of risk here where the biggest one here is that I have too many members in privileged groups. Now we're also going to map out a topology view of what Active Directory looks like. Now again, if we're a company that's going through mergers and acquisitions, we've increased this complexity over the years. Um, often it's very difficult to just even understand how Active Directory fits together. So here we're going to map out the domains. We're going to map out how these domains connect together through trust relationships. But we're also going to map out the attributes and the settings associated to these trust relationships. So do these trust relationships have any risky settings that would pose a risk? Um, you know, that could be um, different attributes such as external or not protected. It could be that it allows um, TGT tickets to be passed through um, each of these trust relationships, for example. Um, but again, it starts to understand the attack surface. If we have bi-directional trust relationships between all of our domains, um, and we have an insecure domain that we've just acquired, what we're now essentially doing is allowing an attacker to potentially compromise that insecure domain um, and then get into the rest of the organization through these trust relationships. Now we're gonna to start to also map and prioritize um, risks inside the organization. So here we're gonna do that through what we call our indicators of exposure. Now, these are the areas of risk that we see inside the domains, inside the, the, the domains that we're monitoring inside the organization. So when we group and color code them by severity, um, we can see here that we have three different categories and we have a fourth category at the bottom, but we put them into critical, high, medium and low. Now, we also have complexity scores assigned to each of these. So as an organization, not only can you now understand the biggest areas of risk to the business, but also the ones that we can fix remediate very quickly you know a complexity score is about how easy this is as a business to target and remediate so um, this is about low-hanging fruit quick wins how do we improve that security posture very quickly now we're going to look for a number of different areas across active directory um, such as access controllers changes where we see you know potentially over permissive access incorrect ownership of domain controllers um, or even group policy objects that allow access to the domain controllers. A very um, common pathways that attackers will look to use to get access to a domain controller, they'll look to move laterally to it, and then they'll look to go after the ntds.dip file, which is the Active Directory database. They're gonna use it to start extracting password hashes, uh, and then they're gonna use that to you know, go after admin accounts. We can look for primary group ID manipulation, um, very common in the likes of DC shadow attacks where um, these are particularly stealthy, very, very difficult to detect through traditional event log monitoring, but a DC shadow attack could change the user primary group ID <clears throat> and it's gonna allow an attacker to authenticate through that particular service and that legacy um, kind of way of connecting and authenticating through the domain. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. 
Now, as we scroll down, we have your high severity issues. So we're going to be looking for several different areas here. Accounts that could have a blank password, for example, there's a particular flag set in Active Directory on user objects where if they have this flag set, um, if an attacker gets hold of a privileged object, gets access to be able to change these passwords, they're going to be able to reset these passwords to a blank password regardless of a password policy. If an attacker is able to reset these passwords to a blank password, um, they're going to do that. They're going to use these uh, accounts to start hiding activities. They're going to use them to start testing um, access to data. They're going to use them to start um, you know, maybe escalating privileges on these accounts and performing the attack is another way of uh, you know, distracting security teams. We're then going to see medium and low. These are more your sort of best practice and hygiene exercises. So if we did have sleeping accounts, for example, um, where people may have left the business, the accounts are still enabled, but they are no longer disabled. Where users, standard users, read-only domain users are allowed to join computers to the domain. If an attacker gets hold of an account here that is allowed to join computers to the domain, um, attackers can very easily manipulate this particular setting and they can start adding as many machines as they want to the domain. And often this is a very quick way that they can get access to a machine. They can add it to the domain. They get full control over that machine because they've added it to the domain um, and that's going to give them escalated privileges inside the environment already. Now, context is key when we look at active virtual security issues. Um, we talked briefly about um, a knowledge gap often in, in environments and in kind of um, active directory teams, infrastructure teams, security teams, but really understanding the inner workings and the inner details of active directory. So here we're going to be able to expand each one of these objects where I can take dangerous Kerberos delegation, for example. Um, we're going to provide an executive summary of what this is. Documents that take you to some further reading. And then the attacker tools that are used to exploit this material, this particular area of AD. Now, when we talk about attacker tools here, what we're going to do is start to correlate um, activity with other solutions that you may be using. So EDR, antivirus, if you're feeding these kind of alerts into um, SOC and SIM scenarios, and if we see one of these tools being run, we know that these areas are used to target um, dangerous delegation, for example. How do we now start to prioritize our investigations, our threat hunting, um, or maybe just apply some additional controls and monitoring around these particular objects to make sure they're not being compromised? We're then going to list a list of, uh, we're then going to list your impacted domains on the right hand side in a single pane of glass. So if we are monitoring 30 domains, each domain that has a risk for dangerous delegation associated to it is going to appear there on the right hand side. Vulnerability details is going to start to go into a bit more detail, a bit of an education piece behind why this is important, why this is a risk, and really why as a business we need to be able to remediate this. Our Deviant Objects is going to list the affected objects here that we have found and tracked inside the business. So on the left hand side, we can see the type of the object, for example, whether that's a user or computer in this instance. The center of the screen is going to tell us where this object resides and which object is affected. And over to the right hand side, we see the directory of the domain that it sits in and the reason it's been flagged. Now, while we put this indicator as a bit of a heading for dangerous Kerberos delegation, we actually look for several different types of delegation. We don't just look for one, we don't just flag one area of risk. Uh, we actually look for six different types of dangerous delegation. Now here we can do a number of different things from exporting this list to a CSV, for example, um, by filtering reasons. So if we wanted to prioritize unconstrained delegation first, here we can go ahead and filter by the objects that are um, impacted by that particular reason. And again, if we wanted to filter by domain, maybe we wanted to prioritize an individual domain first or a collection of domains, here we can go ahead and refine those results further. Now we can also expand each one of these objects out where we're going to detail exactly why this object has been flagged as a risk. So again, we're not going to leave you to assume or leave, you know, make assumptions here that, you know, everyone knows what unconstrained delegation means. So we're going to list the attributes that are impacted, where those attributes sit, the values that are in those attributes, and we're going to put the detail behind why this is a risk. So now we know what it is, what the risk is, which objects are affected and actually how are they affected, we can then get a recommendations. What is it we now need to do as an organization to be able to remediate and fix these issues. Where do we need to go? Where do we need to look at? Which settings do we need to change? And here we're going to provide all that detail for you. So if we take not protected against delegation, 
there's a particular tick box we need to change that says the account is sensitive and cannot be delegated. This is against privileged objects. Here we're going to tell you to go into Active Directory Users and Computers. We need to add this particular value to this particular attribute. And to do that, we need to tick the box to say the account is sensitive and cannot be delegated. And that box resides in the account tab of the account properties. Yeah, very quickly now, we may not understand, uh, or hopefully at this point, we now start to understand the risk behind this, but we're now going to be able to detail exactly how we can fix it almost in a step by step guide. Now, depending on the indicator is going to depend on the recommendation. And we do try and make this as easy as possible. If I take the accounts that could have a blank password, which we briefly talked about earlier in the recommendations tab here, we actually provide a PowerShell command along with additional detail. But here you can go in, you can copy and paste this PowerShell command. You can assign it to a service ticket that then gets assigned to an AD admin. And here they just need to change the username for the affected object that we found. And then we can remediate or clear those flags very, very quickly. Now that's how we start to group and kind of um, prioritize the risks associated to Active Directory. Um, but this is all done on our continuous monitoring. Now the continuous monitoring is in the trail flow. And the trail flow is where we're going to capture every replication event that's happening in the AD environment. Um, now, in a real production environment, AD is changing and replicating all the time. We're going to start to see a, a kind of constant stream of events that are happening. In, um, in a production or a test environment, I'm going to have to go ahead and make some changes. So we're just going to go ahead uh, and go to an active directory environment. Um, and uh, we'll go ahead and use. Uh, da -da -da. I don't have him. I was going to use Ted Hastings for any of the um, uh, line of duty fans, but we'll go ahead and change a, uh, a different object. We'll go ahead and use Bruce Wayne. Now, there's a particular attack in Active Directory called um, an AS rep um, roasting attack. Um, this uses and exploits um, weak Kerberos configurations on user accounts. So not only are we going to be able to detect where these flags are set, but if these flags do get set for whatever reason, maybe by accident, uh, we can change the encryption type of Kerberos, for example, where I can go ahead and apply this setting. We're going to see a new event appear in the background and we're going to see an alert happening instantly to say that we have a misconfiguration here against this Kerberos setting. Now, that's not the only setting that we could have against weak Kerberos configuration. We could actually set the flag here to do not require Kerberos pre-authentication. Again, I could go ahead and apply this setting. We're going to see another event come through, another risk being flagged. Um, and then again, depending on scenarios, if we're feeding this into a SIM, a SOC team, um, email alerting, we're going to be able to capture that information as quickly as the changes made in AD. Now we're going to be able to delve into each of these events. So if we take the first event here for Bruce Wayne, we've already flagged this as an alert. So depending on how we're integrating this into the kind of wider ecosystem, you know, we may have already flagged this alert. We're going to track changes made to each of the attributes. <clears throat> so we're going to be able to see everything about this particular object. We can start to do, see the description field you know, when the password was last entered incorrectly, for example, whether the account is set to expire, whether the password is set to expire. Um, we're going to be able to look at the user account control attribute. And here we can hover over this individual attribute where we see a change was made. The value before was password not required and normal. And we now see a new value being added into this particular attribute. Now, we do color code these to show whether or not it was added, deleted or left unchanged. Um, now, what does this mean? Well, again, some of this might be difficult to understand, but this is the way that Active Directory sends us this information. What we're going to do is provide some intelligence and add some intelligence on top where we have the deviance tab here. Now, when we delve into the deviance tab, we can very quickly see that we have a misconfiguration. We can see the settings associated to this particular change. We're going to contextualize it. And we can now delve directly into that indicator where we can flag this particular object or again we can start to understand the wider detail here so when we see Kerberos configuration on a user account we now have this particular indicator flagged we can see bruce wayne is there we can see there are two different risks against this object we can see the details behind these risks and we're now know, going to know that that is a risk we're going to have that flagging as an alert now that tile is, or that indicator is going to be flagged. We can see Kerberos configuration on the user account has now become available. Well, what happens if we go ahead and remediate these settings? So, you know, we've now flagged these as an alert. We want to go ahead and actually 
you know, fix these settings and reverse these changes, we can go back into Active Directory. We can go ahead and untick this particular option. We can untick that particular setting and we can reapply that. Um, we're going to capture that change. And what we're going to do here is we're going to put a little red mark next to it to say that you know, this change has now resolved this particular deviance or a collection of deviances against this object. Now, when we delve into this event, we're going to be able to see the reversal of these changes. So again, under the user account control attribute here, we can see that we've before we see use DES key only and do not require pre-authentication. We've now removed both of these values. Again, we can start to evidence the success back to the business. We can show the deviances and we can see we now have a resolved timestamp against them. So if we were doing threat hunting and investigation, for example, um, if we did want to close out this incident, we can evidence this through this resolved timestamp. So not only is it about detecting these alerts very quickly, but it's also about detecting the changes that remediate these alerts very quickly. You know, we want to make sure that you know, any time changes are made that this is impacted um, or reflected in the interface that we're monitoring. So we understand the risk at that point in time. So when I go back to indicators of exposure here, what we're now going to do is go back to medium and we no longer see Kerberos configuration against the user account. That setting has completely disappeared. I can go to show all indicators here where we can still see this now out the box, but we see that there's no domain associated to it because we don't see any risks. I can delve into it, I can get a deviant objects, and we see this is completely blank. Now we provide this information, um, which means that not only can we start to you know, understand what's going on, we can alert on this information, but we can also use it as that threat hunting and forensic investigations. So if we want to start to understand any changes made to a particular object, for example, like our domain admins group, I could do a very quick query here where we can start to see access controller changes and permission changes across this object. We can see group membership changes again where we can delve into groups. We can see a member has been added and we see Steve Arnott has been added into this particular group. Now we know that this has created a risk because we see a little red marker next to it. But this has also created a deviance, but we now see that we have too many members in a domain admins group. Um, we have a threshold here of two members and we actually have 13. We're going to list each of the members in that group. We can do this on individual objects, as I've just demonstrated. We can do it on you know, particular machines, for example. So if we want to look at any changes made to the domain controller, we can do that. We can look at particular attributes. So if I wanted to look at the user account control attribute um, and look for anything that has a trusted for delegation flag. So this is a flag that allows things like unconstrained delegation, different types of delegation. We can change our timestamp here to look at anything in June that may have posed this risk. We can now see all the events that match this particular query where we have a flag set for trusted for delegation. So again, I can go into each of these events. We can see the changes that are made here. We actually see the trusted for delegation flag being added into this particular object. Now we can also do this across group policy um, and the sysfold feed. So um, now very commonly we're seeing ransomware spread through sysfold feeds. Um, sysfolds are very difficult um, area to track, particularly through security log monitoring on, on domain controllers and often organizations don't track the sysfold feed. So here we do collect the sysfold data. We're going to collect every single change made to sysfold, whether that's new folders being created, new files being added, group policy configuration changes, um, down to access control exchanges or permissions, delegation rights across those objects. So here I can do a global path search equals sysfold, where we're now going to change the source event for any sysfold activity. Now we can start to see new objects being added. We can see um, ACL changes being made that are posing a risk to the environment. Now, attackers will often look to leverage sysfo, as I said, to start adding scripts, start adding objects into scripts, start adding malicious files. So very quickly, we can see a ransom.exe file being added into this particular attribute in group policy. Now, again, um, you know, this may be a legitimate file. This may be a legitimate change. This may have been a change that we weren't aware of or weren't expecting. Maybe we want to apply some additional monitoring or control around it, or we actually want to remove this executable so we can understand what it is before any wider damage can be caused. We do track all of this activity. So if you know what it is you're searching and you want to build those queries, we can build that expression out. We can also help with some kind of custom and commonly used expressions. 
Um, we're also going to provide a magic wand here where we can detail and help you out really with, with building that query. So here we're going to provide a list of pre-built attributes, for example. Um, we're going to group them by heading. Um, I won't take you through all of these because there's going to be quite a lot of attributes, but you can start to see we've got class schema attributes, for example, computer attributes, users and groups. We're then going to be able to enter our value. We can change the uh, queries here to use AND and OR queries. Uh, we can add multiple rules and we can add AND and ORs this way as well and build subqueries into those uh, into those queries. Once we're happy with that query, we can go and validate it and then we can have that search criteria then um, searching for all events that match that particular query. Now, last and not least, you know, how do we start to get some of this information out and how do we feed this into kind of wider security teams, um, ecosystems and you know, SIM being probably one of the biggest examples here. So we can go ahead to system, uh, we can go to configuration uh, and then we can really start to build out um, our, our syslog feeds. So for, for customers that are using um, uh, Splunk, for example, QRadar, Sentinel, and we do have apps for these solutions, which are going to make it as easy as possible to integrate, put it into friendly formats. Um, if you are using wider solutions such as uh, Exabeam, Logrhythm, for example, uh, we are working on integrations with these, but today it would be just through a standard syslog feed. Now here we can start to create multiple different syslog feeds where I've got, just got this created today. Sorry, apologies, I felt like I had a sneeze coming. Um, here we can go ahead and we can do a number of different things. So if I go in and, and edit one of my existing alerts, we can choose where we want to send this information to. So I've got the collector and IP or the, the host name that we want to send um, the, the information to, the port and protocol that we want to use, how we want the alert to trigger. So here I've selected on each deviance where we're going to pre-correlate a lot of this information for you. So we're going to look at the events that are happening from Active Directory when one of the events matches or, or breaches one of these queries, um, you know, flags one of these alerts, we're just going to send that alert into the SIM at this point. Now we're going to apply some additional context, we're going to apply some additional intelligence around it, but we don't just want to send every single event that we collect into the SIM. We know this gets particularly noisy, uh, we know often a lot of the events are useless, um, and we also know this is going to cost money because traditionally SIMs are licensed for events per second. So we also have the ability to go ahead um, and build custom queries, for example. So here again, I've got my same syslog format, uh, but here I've triggered the alert on changes. And what I've put in here is a custom query that is going to tell me um, or flag an alert anytime a new account is created in the AD environment. Now, you may or may not want this particular alert, but um, here we're going to be able to detail the exact settings. We're going to put the SAM account type as a normal user account. We're going to choose the password last set flag as 1601, which is a default setting when new accounts are created. And we also want to match a bad password time, which is also matched to 1601, the year 1601, um, which is also a, 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 a standard setting when you create a user account. I don't know why Microsoft used the 1601 year. Um, it's a little bit bizarre that, that, that that's over 400 years old, but it's, a, it's just a particular setting that they use. But anytime we capture a new user being created in Active Directory, this is going to forward that event to the syslog uh, where we're going to be able to track that activity. Maybe we're going to use that to track bulk alerting of user accounts, for example, or bulk creation of user accounts and attacker may be doing this to hide their activities, distract security teams. Uh, but here we can go ahead and build those custom queries and feed this information into the SIM. Um, I've also got a final alert here for alerting detection. So this is a new module that we're starting to move into. We do have attack detection available today. Now, uh, we're going to want to tick all of these options. Um, you know, I don't think it harms anyone, even if we have uh, an overlap of attack detection. Uh, but here we're going to be able to detect when a DC sync attack is happening, golden ticket, DC shadow, credential dumping in the LSAS database. So where attackers are looking to get a foothold over the domain controller um, and extracting the passwords from memory. And then your more kind of low and slow attack techniques such as password guessing, um, so brute force attacks against a single object uh, and password spray where they are attempting the same password across numerous accounts in fairly quick succession. So that's how we start to get some of this information out into kind of wider um, ecosystems, how we contextualize this information, but also how we hopefully, you know, enrich some of your the data being fed into, um, that goes into kind of targeting security investigations and really hoping to help reduce the time that it's going to take to perform those investigations. 
Now, I am conscious of time, given we've probably got um, you know just over ten minutes left. Um, but I'm happy to um, open this out to the, the I guess the the floor now. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions at this point, but I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Uh, Chris, we have had uh, one pop through, which mm. I think you sort of touched on because um, it popped through uh, quite early on. And the question is, how does this compare to Microsoft ATA slash ATP? And I suppose ATA, the, the mainstream support ended for that this year. And did, yeah. A, yeah, and ATP, if I, I believe that's what Microsoft are now calling Defender for Identity. So. Yeah, so um, lots of different revisions. So, and and you're you're exactly right there. So, um, we actually a lot of our customers use both together, um, and I think that's that's probably the best answer that I can provide in in the sense that it isn't a case of one or the other. It's you know providing the the complete view of Active Directory. So, Microsoft's ATA ATP Defender for Identity is really looking at or is heavily focused on post compromise detection. So it's very reliant on attackers getting in. It's applying UBA to baseline what is normal behavior and detecting on anomalies to that behavior. Um, but it's doing a lot of alerting around things like pass the hash, pass the ticket, golden ticket detection. Um, again, it's relying heavily on an attacker to be inside the business or someone detecting, um, you know, distracting from their normal day to day activities. We're not applying UBA to this if we see a particular risky change made in Active Directory, largely it doesn't matter who makes that change, but that leaves a, a vulnerability that an attacker can exploit or a weakness that an attacker can exploit. It doesn't matter if an AD admin makes that change and that change was normal behavior, um, it still poses a risk to the business. So what we're gonna do is give the, ability, the organization the ability to proactively harden and prevent a lot of the kind of attack paths that lead to some of these, you know, past the hash, past the ticket, golden ticket attacks. Okay. Um, I've got another one. Uh, what's, your, what's your typical size customer then? What is the typical kind of organization that uses AD? Good question. AD? Uh, yeah, and I think I think the best answer to that is active touch is a big problem in any organization. So it really just comes down to someone with an AD environment. Um, and, and to give you a bit of context to that, our smallest customer is about 50 users. It's a small financial services firm. Um, what we see in these kind of environments is Often IT, uh, and I'm going to use IT as a very broad scope here, but they have one IT admin or maybe you know an IT manager and a an IT admin, and those guys are responsible for infrastructure, networking, security. You know, they don't have time to look at Active Directory. They don't maybe understand Active Directory. They just want an alert to say when a change has been made so they can do something about it. When we go into the much larger enterprises, you know, these guys have the luxury of having you know, red teams, blue teams, SOC teams, they have you know, AD admins, they have infrastructure teams, they have networking teams, but they're now managing a much larger threat surface in an organization. You know, some, some global organizations will have millions and millions and millions of AD objects. Uh, you know, it would take an army of individuals to start monitoring this information on a daily basis. They just can't do it. So it's about, it's about prioritizing the risk, understanding the information and the threat surface and putting either a stake in the ground to say, here is our risk. You know, we now need to make sure that we don't increase this moving forward or that we're making sure, you know, the business is secure. And again, it's about this journey. We're not expecting this to be fixed overnight, but it's how do we start to improve that security posture over you know, the next 18 months, the next five years or the next 10 years. OK, that's great. Thanks, Chris. We've had another one. Um, what does the integrations with SIM products provide? And an add on to that, when would you foresee the logarithm integration being available? Um, you should phone us and we can talk about a modern <laughs> SIM tool. Um, the yeah. that's put that. Sorry, that's a bit mean. That's um, but sorry, Chris, carry on. That's a good question. Unfortunately, I don't have any timelines on the logarithm integration. I, I can ask the question internally um, and I can see if I can come back to you and answer, but I'm not aware of anything official at this point. Um, we are working on the wider kind of integrations. Um, in terms of what we're providing into a SIM, it's really, there's a number of different things. It's contextual enrichment. Um, so providing you know, actionable intelligence behind the alerts that we're generating are not just a raw event. Um, and it's also about how we then correlate some of this activity with additional logs that you may be collecting. So if we take a curb roasting attack, for example, um, there are things in Active Directory that allow a curb, a curb roasting attack to be possible. So a privileged account with a Kerberos service or a service ticket, for example. Now, while we won't detect 
a Kerberos attack happening or Kerberosing attack happening because that's typically done on an endpoint, the security log on a domain controller is going to tell you when a request is made to access that service ticket. Now that doesn't make a change in Active Directory, so we don't see that request, but we do see the objects in Active Directory that make this attack possible. So we're going to flag those areas of risk, which means that we can now apply additional control and monitoring around it. So not only can we apply additional controls around these particular objects or these areas of risk, but we then say to the likes of Logarithm, for example, we have this account that is highly sensitive to a curb roasting attack. We've now seen this curb roast ticket request. You know, now again, we're going to provide that additional context and that additional enrichment that you would have never seen before. Cool. So actually, Chris, a question from me, actually. Would, would most of your customers also be running a SIEM and have a, a proper SOC service in place as well? Ideally, um, again, <laughs> some, some companies just don't have the luxury of having that. And you know, we have customers that don't have SIMs um, and therefore we'll, you know, we'll use email alerting, for example. Um, you know, sometimes it, it, public sector organisations, for example, a lot of them have budget constraints that go way beyond having the luxury of having a SIM. Um, at that point, it's about prioritising the right tool set. So, um, yeah, it really depends. If you do have a SIM, great. You know, we can help enhance the, the investigations, the activity, the context and enrichment. If they don't, we can still provide a lot of value to Active Directory, probably visibility you don't have today. And then it's about providing the alerts in a different format through the likes of email, for example. OK, uh, we've had a couple of uh, licensing products, which I, I guess is the person with sales in their name I should answer. And Chris, tell me if I've got this wrong. But the question is, how is this licensed? And quite simply, it's done on AD objects, I think. Uh, so we look at the user object um, and we look at we look at enabled user objects. OK. Uh, and someone's uh, mentioned about the product being called out at the time. Um, I, I wonder if that recent renewal is a, uh, a tenable IO or a tenable SC renewal. So uh, obviously you guys are still meshing together as one, but th th although there are bundles within tenable that people can buy, AD yeah. still remains sat to the side for the time being, doesn't it, Chris? Yeah, correct. At the moment, it is it is a completely siloed solution. Um, now that we have a lot of people asking for integration, pretty much every call I'm on at the moment is, is asking for integration into IOSC, Lumen, you know, wh whichever products will help give the, the visibility. I have to be a little careful what I say, um, but all I will say is integration is coming. Um, whether or not it comes this year, I think maybe a little optimistic. So I'd be kind of envisioning early next year. Um, but that that's where I currently see this. But there's, there's a lot happening in the background. OK, and this is quite an interesting one. The sort of open source versus proper enterprise product question. How would you compare your product against Bloodhound? Yeah, very good question. So um, I know that Bloodhound are making some changes at the moment, um, but Bloodhound is um, primarily an offensive and attacking tool. Um, you know, traditionally up until very recently, it has not been an enterprise ready solution. Um, it's a point in time solution. So you use Sharp Hound to do a data collection from Active Directory. You then have to, you know, that then does a data collection into a JSON file. You import that JSON file into the Bloodhound interface where you run reports on this information. It's not a continuous monitoring product because it's an offensive tool. It lacks a lot of context. It doesn't provide any kind of enrichment behind this data. It literally just gives you, you know, I'm on this object. You know, we have a session here that allows me to get group membership here. Um, and then using that group membership, I can access this domain controller, for example. So we're going to go way above and beyond that. And the reason we talk about Bloodhound and that we use some of this is um, if anyone is familiar with any of the GitHub stuff around Bloodhound, um, our CEO, a chap called Emmanuel Grass, um, was the kind of brains and had all the thesis and the theories behind what goes into Bloodhound, which is ultimately the, the AD control paths. So that's why we leverage kind of a lot of that kind of technology underneath the hood, but we've built an enterprise ready application that has largely reverse engineered what is an offensive tool and use it to be able to defend and protect against AD attacks. Great, that's that's I love this when we have enough questions that I don't need to make <laughs> any up. So thank you everyone for <laughs> contributing to that. Chris, I thought that was a fantastic demo. I've not seen it um, demonstrated like that before. I've seen all the positioning, um, but I've not seen a demo. So thank you ever so much for that. Um, I guess to the attendees, um, thank you for coming along. Um, if you do want to find out more, 
please just respond to your invite to this and uh, we can set up uh, one to ones with Chris or with the, the rest of the team at Tenable.ad uh, and we can push it along from there. Um, you'll almost certainly be hearing from the people that invited you to this just to uh, just to make sure because, you know, we still need to sell some stuff to uh, justify keep running these events. But um, I, I think that's it. I think, Chris, I think we're done. Thank you ever so much. Um, yeah, no problem. But, yeah, thank you everyone for coming. You can have four minutes back of your day as a free <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you everyone for your time. Cheers, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Bye, everyone. Bye.